So today we've got um, Ari uh, from Zingerman's and Katie Frank, who's from Zingerman's uh, training, and uh, they're going to be talking, but we've also got lots of other folks from uh, Menlo and uh, different companies. Uh, got a couple of colleagues from the University of Michigan. I see Jane Dutton there and uh, Bob Quinn, uh, who's probably been up for a couple hours writing, uh, which he usually does in the morning. Bob, is that right? Are you there, Bob? Have you been writing yet? Yeah, I've been doing some writing. I figured it out. You're, you're a guy that's predictable on your routine, which is good. Uh, so Ari, I'm going to let you start out and uh, you could talk a little bit about just, just in general, uh, how has this, I understand how it's impacted you, but what have you been doing to try to manage uh, through this crisis? Well, I guess I would say we're trying to do the same things we try to do every other day when there's no pandemic. Uh, I, I guess I've started looking at it a little bit like there, there was a big earthquake and through really no fault of anybody on this call, uh, all of a sudden every, the street you used to drive on, you can't drive on anymore. And the building that used to look good is now fell, you know, now fell over. So I, I don't know. I mean, in, in some ways, we're really just doing the same things. We're we're getting together with the right people and trying to figure out how to adapt to the marketplace and how to stay true to our values and stay true to our vision and our mission and keep involving people and stay safe and, and provide great experiences. I mean, in, in that sense, it isn't really a whole lot different. Uh, it's just shaken up, obviously, through whatever metaphor you want to use. It's shaken up a lot of the routine. So, uh you know, Zinc, Katie can speak to Zinc Train, but you have a business that was, you know, rolling along with, you know, relatively full seminars and lots of speaking events coming up and dropped from busy to near zero in like three days. Uh, you know, you have food tours, which was filling up tours to Europe and all of a sudden dropped to zero in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, and then you have the other end, which is on a positive note, mail order is really busy. Uh, because people are ordering from all over the country and then most everybody's in between. So the three restaurants, uh, Deli, Miss Kim and the Roadhouse were still open for carry out and delivery and we're doing, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's busy for carry out standards, but it's still about a third of sales. So we're facing the same situation that uh, a lot of people on this call are facing, which is how do you, you have an infrastructure that was built gradually, slowly, you know, in a moderately healthy way over a long period of time. And all of a sudden your sales are 35% of what they were. What do you do, you know, and, and try, how do you stay viable? And I talked to a friend of mine in uh, Colorado uh, the other night and he's, you know, part or leads and part owns, you know, four or five businesses, a little bit of a similar model. Uh, like we do. And he's got one business that's uh, summer camps for kids, uh, adventure camps, and they're going to drop from 13 million or 14 million and what they would have done in sales to 4 million. And they're going to lose $2 million. <laughs> oh. Yeah. You know, so we're all challenged, but trying to stay safe and provide great experiences for the staff and great experiences for the customers and try to stay stay the course and get through this thing so we can make it a good story to tell at zinc train in five years yeah, how, material how, for us and bob for their next books <laughs> yeah for sure i'm sure the uh, authors are, are keeping deep notes because this is going to be something we'll be talking about the rest of our lives and writing about uh just in terms of um thanks for the start ari and uh, i'm going to move to katie in a minute but i just want to couple of housekeeping things. Please keep your mics off if you're not speaking so that we, we don't hear any background noise. Uh, please use the uh, function where you can write, uh, write us notes and we'll, we're taking on the chat line, we'll take questions for Ari and, and Katie. And uh, how many others out there, could you raise your hands if you're running a business and uh, trying to keep things going during this time? How many, how many business owners, Rich, Sheridan? Uh, uh, okay, I see a couple from uh, Roger. You, you're sort of running a business, okay? Uh, so let's let's uh, talk. Uh, Kathy and Bill, Bill Bill are here from um, Argus Farm Stop, and uh, you guys just want to. Your business has gone completely the other way. You want to talk about that, Kathy or Bill, and just mention a little bit what's happening with uh, with Argus and how that has totally changed your model. Sure. Okay. Hi, Bill. Mute there, Kathy. 
<laughs> um, Bill, you want to just introduce yourself? And, yeah. yeah, I'm Bill Brinkerhoff, and uh, with Kathy, who's in the other room, uh, we own Argus Farm Stop, which is an everyday farmer's market in Ann Arbor. And our mission is to grow the local food economy and, and make it easier for people to buy from local farms, which has had a little bit more challenges um, than, it, than it should have. Um, with the kind of the uh, arrival of COVID, um, the farmer's markets were all closed um, and they're starting to barely reopen, but um, that had a big impact. And then we also had this, you know, the risk of COVID, you know, amongst our staff and with customers. And so, and I think he's frozen there. All right, we're gonna we're gonna move on. Uh, uh, Katie, Katie, where, there you are, Katie. You want to? Katie's got an interesting story. Maybe you could just start, Katie, by talking about the Zingerman's experience and your 14 years uh, to bring you to where your position is today. Sure. Thank you so much for for having us. Um, I've got a master's in human resource development and went and worked at a bakery after grad school and got introduced to Zingerman's that way down in Nashville and um, had the good fortune of visiting in early 2005. Um, and I had had Zingerman's on my radar for probably three years ahead of that. Uh, when I visited, I thought this is, the food's as good as I thought and the service was really great. And I learned about the back end infrastructure in terms of support for staff. And that really aligned with my background in training and development. Uh, but Zingtrain wasn't hiring when I first applied. Uh, through some circuitous routes. Uh, I did end up at the Bakehouse as a manager in training and worked there as a retail manager for six and a half years, and then joined Zing Train in 2011 as a trainer and then became a partner in 2018. Uh, I do hail from the great state of Ohio. And uh, as I said earlier, no one from Ohio aspires to move to Ann Arbor typically. Uh, so Zingerman's had to be pretty compelling uh, to, to want to move up here, not knowing anyone. Um, it was a little bit of a hard sell for, for my immediate family, but uh, I, I haven't looked back and Ann Arbor is now home. So uh, grateful to be here. So Katie, could you talk a little bit about what's happening now uh, in terms of, uh, fr from your point of view, in terms of uh, your, your business thing, train has been really hard hit. Uh, talk about the impact and then how you're managing your staff, how you're uh, continuing to, to, to try to keep things going. Sure. We, um, well, in, in early March, we were hiring for a new trainer because Maggie, my co-managing partner, the founding partner at Zing Train is going to retire at the end of July. And so we went from getting ready to do in-person interviews to furloughing all of our 11 staff. Uh, we saw the immediate need uh, to hold on to any cash that we had. Um, and so we furloughed our staff for five weeks, thankfully got the small business loan and were able to bring people back, uh, a portion of our staff back um, for our event staff that we, we host in-person training. So we, we knew in-person training wasn't gonna be viable for some time to come. And, and so uh, we have laid off uh, four of our staff and we have a core of seven plus Maggie and I that um, have been working steadfastly on getting training uh, into a virtual format. And so we are offering virtual workshops now, both one hour and two and a half hour sessions. And we are gonna start in the next couple weeks, we've been marinating on doing um, e-courses online and, and we've needed to get some immediate revenue. And so we started doing the virtual workshops uh, a few weeks ago we started and, and now we're getting ready to um, design some online courses, um, both so, so on demand and then also for, you know, a week long um, type of e-learning course. So we've gone, <clears throat> we needed to pivot a complete 180. I mean, we're in-person trainers. And so um, while we wanted to do e-courses for a while, it just was on the back burner. And yeah. now it's uh, squarely in the, on the front of the stove and uh, we're, we're, making, we're making it happen. So the, uh, this is the proverbial kick in the pants to get you moving, I guess. Huh? Well, now we have the space and time. So I, I'm, yeah. I continue to try to look for the gifts uh, in this and, uh, we now have space and time to do that. And otherwise we would be occupied with other things and it would you know, be getting short shrift. And, and now um, the pressures of greater <laughs> and uh, we're, 
we're thankful for our team. We have an amazing team that, that's working a lot and making a lot happen in, in a short order. So Katie, you mentioned uh, cash flow. And uh, as I'm talking to many of my clients, this is the biggest problem that I think in the, the plush times of the last 10 years, people have taken their eye off the need to have that proverbial several months in the bank uh, and uh, people may not understand the, the Zingerman's model, but are you, is your cash uh, separate from the cash of the big company? How does that work? When you look a good at question. It? We are one of 10 businesses and we all operate independently, although we share the same name. We, Zingtrain has thankfully been in a really strong cash position for a long time because people prepay for their seminars and then they might not come for six or eight months. Um, what we we experience though is that people want to refund when we're not going to host training. And so we, um, when we looked at our cash, one of the things that was so dire in March was about 90% of our cash was prepaid. Uh -huh. So basically it was not our money. And, and so that's why we knew we needed to take drastic action um, to preserve what cash we had. Um, so our cash pool is not related to any of the other parts of Zingerman's. Uh, so Zing train itself, um, so we've gone through all of our refunding that needs to happen. And, and now with our virtual workshops, we're able to, you know, people pay and then the workshop happens um, the short, short cycle. So uh, we have been able to recover our, our cash situation in addition to the small business loan. So I don't know if that answers your question, but all of the operations are separate. No, I think that's important. And uh, I think that uh, this is a time when people are really looking at the, uh, the cash piece of it and trying to talk to their accountants and C CFOs. And uh, what about uh, money from the government? Has that been a, a factor for you guys? Oh, absolutely. We were very grateful to have a small business loan through level one here locally. And they've been an amazing partner um, to try to navigate all of the twists and turns for anyone else out there that's received a PPP loan. Um, the, you know, the forgiveness portion is still changing on a daily or hourly basis. Um, and so we were very fortunate um, to have received that. And all, all, of our, all of our businesses have, although mail order gave theirs back because they haven't had hardship, but um, they weren't, you know, when we were first doing all the applications, they didn't know how, if things would continue apace, but um, the other nine have definitely used the governmental funds and uh, we feel very fortunate. Rob, right. can oh. you comment on that, Ari? Right. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly helped. Uh, Zing trains actually where it's ideal. Uh, it works really well in an office setting. Uh, it's it's I, it clearly it was well intended. I guess if anybody, you know, on this call, if we wrote a 900 page law legal document in five days, it probably would have a lot of problems with it just because the nature of going that quickly. <clears throat> and there are a lot of problems with it. It's uh, particularly not well suited the way they wrote it to restaurant situation. So the idea was to forgive and cover your payroll and your rent. Uh, but in order to avoid certain problems, they put uh, any number of riders in. So A, it had to be used within eight weeks upon reception. Well, that's fine. If you're at Zing Train, you call everybody back. They work from home. Uh, it's all great. But if you're in a restaurant setting, it's not that easy to get people back if you're only doing a 30 or sales or a lot of restaurants around the country aren't even open at all. What do you, what do you do with the loan? And then they also tied it to uh, the forgiveness piece is tied as probably 70% of the people on the call already know if they got it uh, tied to head count. And so again, if you're only working with a third of your staff, but you need to have all of your staff in order to get a hundred percent forgiveness, uh, of what you spent, then that's problematic too. So it's been very challenging for restaurants. Uh, I've been part of a group called Independent Restaurant Coalition, which was only formed about seven weeks ago. People can look it up online, uh, but it's probably, I don't know what it is now, 150 uh, really amazing people coming together to try to put forward programs. And they've done quite a bit of amazing work uh, in, in Washington uh, with the House and the Senate, uh, Congressman Blumenauer, who I never even heard of until last week, uh, from Oregon, who seems to be a wonderful, fascinating, intelligent, creative guy, just uh, made a proposal, uh, presented legislation in the House. It's actually got the acronym Restaurants, which is basically to support a stabilization program, uh, since restaurants really are not going to be able to function remotely close to where they were for the next 
X number of months, uh, which would essentially take the PPP loans as they were intended, not as they've been used in practice and put it uh, into an extended package for independent restaurants, not for chains, not for publicly traded companies. Are you, you're, you're uh, speaking a lot, written several books now. Uh, what, what are the lessons you're, you're learning? Uh, how much does this reinforce what you've already known? How much are you learning that is new? Uh, if you, you know, what, what are you, what are some of the lessons? Maybe you could share that. And also I want to uh, not dominate this by asking all the questions. I want people to take a minute and write questions. We've got some uh, interesting people out there who have the right uh, approach to thinking about this. So ask questions and feel free to ask questions of other people who are on the line too. We have uh, people from various businesses out there. Uh, so feel free to, to ask those as well. Go ahead, Ari, just talk about some maybe lessons learned. Well, I, uh, you know, for me, I, I think it's awfully early to start for me personally to really start announcing these, these great lessons. I, 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 you know, I'm a history major, so things play out over time and I, we're, we're barely into the beginning of this. Uh, and in, Usually, historically, some things are going to change and a lot's going to stay the same. Uh, I'm reading uh, Robin Kelly's uh, biography of Thelonious Monk, the jazz musician. I don't actually listen to a lot of jazz, but it's a fabulous book. Very interesting. And uh, he was born, I think, in 1918. And so uh, just, you know, to show you what, you know, as you as you move further away, the things on the horizon get smaller and smaller, right? So we're 100 years down the road from when Thelonious Monk was an infant. And in this 500 page, highly detailed, excellent, beautifully written book by Robin Kelly, uh, all it says about the Spanish flu is that there was a really bad flu in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina that year, uh, where they lived and 68 people died, but the family survived, but their other problems got worse. <laughs> so <laughs> So just to show, I mean, in context, like this is going to be, I mean, it's enormous right now, but many of the people on this call, most of us made it through 2009. Most of us, many of us made it through, you know, 9-11. And so, yes, things change, but yes, they also stay the same. So the stuff Bob Quinn teaches is universal. It was true in 1900. It was true in 1800. And I think it's going to be true in, 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 in 100 years from now. So what I would suggest for me, at least just learning is that healthy organizations do better, which everybody on this call probably already knew under duress. Uh, organizations that were already challenged, you know, that people weren't working well together, that there wasn't respect for each other, that there wasn't a, a purpose, that there wasn't a mission, a commitment to, to, to each other's success. Those organizations really struggle. So, How do you feel that you're, uh, you're, you have a very unique structure for your business with the 10 yeah. businesses. How do you feel? Is that a, a strength during this time or a challenge? What, what do you uh, think? I don't know. It's just what it is. I mean, I think that the, I haven't really given it a lot of thought because it doesn't really matter. It's just what it is. I mean, it's sort of like saying, is it good to be living in Ann Arbor right now? Like it's where we live. So I'm going to make the best of it. You know, it's, it's challenging, I guess, in some theoretical ways in that, you know, like Katie described, we are separate businesses, so we can't just, you know, the world goes, oh, they're busy at mail order, just move all that money to Zing Train and you're good. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Uh, for us, we have different uh, managing partners in each business, but the reality is that we wouldn't be here without that model. And so I, I think it provides the uh, stability, the entrepreneurship, the creativity, and, and the, the literal and emotional ownership that is, you know, Katie, models every day and and so do the other whatever 20 partners and here we are so uh katie we have a question from dan hamill hamilly uh, i don't know if i pronounce it right but uh, dan, uh, dan asks uh, how will you try to replicate the in-person experience in training that's a good <clears throat> excuse me a good question dan uh unfortunately we can't control the quality of the food for people uh in a virtual setting um, although we have brainstormed, how can we get some food to people that can enjoy it at home? Uh, seriously though, we, um, <clears throat> we use Zoom platform for our two and a half hour and one hour format trainings. And we do a lot with the breakout rooms and uh, use the use of chat, raising of hands, um, you know, 
as we all know on this call, nothing's going to replace in-person training and interactivity is one key part and I think a differentiator for us and we've worked hard to incorporate that into the design of our training. It's a challenge. It is absolutely a challenge. Um, and so we have sometimes when people are, you know, we have everyone on video and they, they are, you know, can raise their hands and speak. Other times they're in the breakouts, um, again, putting questions in chat. The other thing that I think is helpful is we have two trainers on all of our sessions, which feels like a real luxury. Um, and we have one person that typically takes care of our technology. And so when I've done other training, it's been like one person. And um, so I think the other part is we have more um, availability of presenters that, that can answer questions in chat and, and be monitoring uh, what's going on. Um, and, and so I think a few of those things are differentiators and we're getting better at more interactive slides and um, you know, memes and trying to have some fun to incorporate fun because that's another aspect that I think uh, is a nice differentiator, not uh, a bunch of dry content. Thanks. Are you uh, going back? Uh, th this is uh, directed to you, but this this community Ann Arbor uh, is very much dependent on big events. Uh, you guys already missed uh, graduation. Uh, now we're looking at football. We're looking at students might not even return. Kathy McDonald saying, yeah. "What would be the impact if if it does not happen?" I was talking to Ed Davidson yesterday from Bivouac, uh, who's going to be presenting next week, and Ed said that. They, they estimate maybe Susan Polly could comment on this. $95 million comes into the Ann Arbor through football alone. So uh, that's, sort of that, that's uncertain if it's going to be a season, if it's going to be a season with, with people in the stands, which is a lot of that $95 million. So I just wonder if you could comment on how much you guys depend on the big events and how do, how do you pivot from that? Well, I mean, I think this is what we're all trying to figure out. I mean, I... I how much do we depend on it is a lot. You know, I mean, everybody, even the people who don't deal with the university depend on the university because there's money coming into the town and there's visitors coming into the town. So uh, will it impact? Absolutely. Everything impacts everything. And that's a big, that's a big piece of impact. Uh, you know, I guess it, it really depends on how one looks at it. And I can certainly go back and forth. If you think the university is going to be closed in perpetuity and there's never going to be students coming back and there's never going to be football again, uh, I guess it's a little bit different than if one looks at it like we got to get through a year and, you know, by a year from this fall, there'll be a vaccine and there'll be a cure and may not, you know, people may be wearing masks, they may not, but it'll be, you know, close to what it was, then it's a little different strategy. So I guess I don't really have a sense of what that really is right now. So I think we just need to, from our end, we need to deal with what is in the moment, uh, which is, like I said, I mean, at the deli, we're at 35%, 40, maybe 40% 40 of sales. So how do you survive, you know, on that? And that's a lot of big changes that need to happen and just got to do our best to make that work. Can you talk about anticipating uh, what it's going to look like at, at, at the restaurant scenes in terms of what, what you're planning for in terms of when, when, yeah, I, I can. Uh, hi, Bill. Uh, you know, the quick answer is again, we don't know. I mean, it's changing every day. Uh, you know, the CDC put out something yesterday. I think that, you know, it says now their belief is that it's the virus is not transferred by surface as much at all, which is pretty different than, you know, when everybody's Lysoling their, their, their doorknobs all day. <laughs> so I was thinking maybe Lysol will be easier to find now in the store. But, you know, so I, I think the reality is it's changing all the time. Clearly, it's going to be different uh, if you can only seat 35 or 50 percent of your capacity. And restaurants were not a highly, you know, high margin industry to begin with. Uh, we're all challenged. Every, every restaurant in the country, how do you get 50% of your seats filled at best uh, and still make it financially viable. So could be things like we're going to seat more people outside, you know, could be uh, shifting, you know, the balance more and more to carry out. Uh, will people be wearing masks pretty clearly? Will they be wearing face shields? I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I just don't know. I mean, hand sanitizer on the tables and my fantasy will have a selection of 20 artisan hand sanitizers uh, <laughs> that people could choose their flavor and, you know, 
barrel aged and you know all sorts of other things that might go with it just for a little entertainment but you know i i think again it's i i don't know i mean i guess i you know you know i you know i had uh surgery uh whatever it's probably 10 years ago now uh for cushing's and you know i didn't have it that bad but it's still a big surgery you know in terms of recovery right so first they tell you it's about six months and then at six months they told me well it's really about 18 months before you feel better and then at 18 months he goes well actually it's as long as you had the disease and we don't know how long you had the disease so it might be five six seven years and then people go you know now they're like do you feel fully recovered i'm like i can't remember what it was like 20 years ago i don't know and and I think it's a lot the same thing. I mean, it's not like you're going to, if people have the illusion that on Tuesday next week, it's going to all be the same. I think that's magical thinking. If we also think that we're going to be in crisis mode for the next 10 years, I, I doubt it. I mean, we're in a highly, there's, there's skilled people in labs all over the country working on this. Uh, it's only been two and a half months. I mean, it's really not a lot of time. And just, I, I wouldn't be shocked if somebody on this call or somebody who, given the people in Ann Arbor, somebody on this call knows somebody who's actually working on a, on a vaccine or a cure or something really innovative somewhere around the world. Well, I know uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's an odd disease, too, in the sense of the, the uh, social yeah. economic aspect of it, where it's hitting so hard in the communities that, that can least afford uh, to have it, but it's also hitting where they're less uh, able to prevent it. I mean, as you're reading this morning that uh, nursing homes even uh, that are in the poor socioeconomic category are much yeah. hard, harder hit than the, the, the nursing homes that are, are better off. Yeah. Uh, and some of the changes have been amazing. Uh, even with people, my, my, uh, my son, Adam, I think uh, who you know well, Ari, yeah. uh, and his whole family had the virus. Uh, they had it for a couple of weeks. They're now recovered. Uh, and actually testing that they have antibodies, which they don't really know what it means. But Adam is a, an editor at the New York Times now, and he had been covering the coronavirus. And so as, as his symptoms developed, he knew damn well what he had. He couldn't get tested because he was in Queens. But they shifted the New York Times now to operating completely out of the office. He hasn't mm -hmm. been in the office in three months, but he's an editor. Right. And uh, the, many businesses are doing that. Google, I think, is maybe not going back for the whole year. Facebook is talking right, about right. that. You can't manage that kind of thing at a restaurant. So uh, it's no, a different story. No. So I see a lot of questions that are all good questions. I, I, we don't know. I mean, we're trying to figure it out. And uh, I, I don't have the sense we're going to even be able to open the dining rooms. And I'm not rushing anybody because I'd rather have the state take its time and, uh, you know, let's get this as close to right as we can. So I think we're at least, you know, a month, maybe two months, maybe three months even from opening. And so they're all good questions people are asking. And like Faris is asking about, you know, minimum orders, how long, you know, people can sit, how long in advance, this is all what we're trying to figure out. And it's, it's really like going back to being a startup and, you know, which we've been through before. The truth is when you're a startup, half the stuff you thought was going to be really awesome doesn't work <laughs> and it's gone in three weeks and things you didn't think were going to happen turn out to, to work really well. So I, I think right now everybody has ideas, but we don't really know what's going to happen. And I think it's safe to say whatever strategies we come up with, we'll try to implement and some will work out and some won't. And Faris, I love your positive enthusiasm. You're, 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 you're the best. Faris is the best. So we're going to break into small groups for a, about 10 minutes and uh, just give people a chance to talk to randomly to three other, to, pe to three people all together. When we come back, I hope I can hear something from uh, our professors, Quinn and uh, Jane Dutton out there and hear some of the perspectives from the, uh, your work and also from the Center for Positive Organization, which has been really preparing for this kind of thing in, a long, in, in, in many ways for a long time. And we also have other business owners. Randy Faber has run a business. Randy, raise your hand out there. And Randy runs a, one of the largest uh, piano training businesses in the world out of Ann Arbor. And we really don't know much about it here, but it's a worldwide business. So maybe you could comment when we come back about how this, what this is like when you have to do business with, uh, with China and, uh, and your business requires you to travel a lot. You're not able to do that. So Emily uh, Freund, I want to thank, who is going to put us into small groups. I just want to take a quick a minute to thank our sponsors, which include 
uh, Zingerman's. Uh, it includes Bank of Ann Arbor. And Bank of Ann Arbor has been uh, incredible in getting its customers and even some of its non-customers uh, the loans. They've been working around the clock from their homes, so thank them. Uh, we also have uh, Office Evolution, uh, which is struggling be, to try to figure out what this means for this, this closed office space. Uh, uh, you know, that now has burned, uh, blossomed in Ann Arbor. Will that be able to keep going at the same rate? And uh, Raymond uh, Financial, which has been helping people figure out the uh, the tax situation and how to manage financially with your, with your money, which we're all very anxious about as well. So we're going to take a process. I think you've probably been through this before. You'll be assigned randomly to a group of three. Uh, Emily, let's make it eight minutes for that group. And then uh, we'll come back. And uh, we're going to go a little bit longer than nine today. So people can feel free to stay on the line till maybe 9.15 if, if you want. So we're going to go to small groups now. Take it away. Sorry, I'm back. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, Ari, uh, what came out of your group? Everything's changing. No, uh, you know, we're all trying to figure it out. Minor, minor technology adaptations can have big impacts. Uh, people still like the human interaction. Not shocking. Uh, we're trying to figure it out. One speaker doing training on Zoom, talking in a monologue for an hour and a half is not good. Uh, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Okay, I'll see, uh, we have a quick quick question from uh, our, Anthony, how's home delivery going? Uh, have you, do you yeah, I, I, Anthony is in uh, Australia right now, so we're not, <laughs> can't hard to deliver to him. Can't bring that to him, but uh, I answered in the chat. Uh, it's going really well. Uh, you know, the Deli and Miss Kim for quite a while, we've been uh, using, <clears throat> I can't even remember which two, two of the general services that everybody else uses. Uh, the Roadhouse, we had not been doing it just because capacity. Uh, but we've started the week before all this came apart. We actually, one of the assistant managers, Bethany Zinger, actually wrote a plan for doing delivery using our own people, which we're doing and I really okay. like. I'm, I, I have some, it's a long conversation, but there's a lot of ethical issues around those delivery services and how they work. and how they deal with the people who they use to do the driving who are not their employees. Uh, it makes tipping in restaurants look like a holistic and grounded model, but <laughs> somehow it's getting, it doesn't get a lot of attention. So I, I really like that we're using our own staff at the roadhouse. We can pay them to get benefits. Uh, they get the tips uh, and, and try to make it work in a more holistic way. So delivery's going good. We haven't figured out how to get it to Australia yet though. All right. But maybe awesome. with Zoom we can do it. Yeah, well, it, just wait for you. It'll be showing up any day now. He's still stuck in Australia, and everybody's. Uh, I got people stuck in Russia, Australia. It's, it's, wow. it's everybody's frozen around. Well, I'm glad to be stuck in Ann Arbor. Yeah, uh, Bob Quinn, are you out there? Not sure what happened. We got some people back, but not everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm out here. I'm here. I'm okay, Bob, you want to comment from your? You're in D.C. still. Yes. Yeah, you want to. Give some uh, some of your wisdom about how you how you see the situation, how you're thinking about it. Uh, yeah, well, there's a couple of things that occur to me. One is, you know, I was listening to to Ari talk for those 20 minutes or so, and I was thinking, what have I learned from this? The single biggest lesson that I picked up this morning is how calm he is. <laughs> um, and I think there's a reason for that. He took us. He took that company through a startup. Start he lived through 2008. In 2008, uh, he made some very counterintuitive decisions with Paul, and they had long-term positive consequences. And that, what that says to me is, this is a this is a crisis, but crisis really is opportunity. And how we react has an enormous influence on that long-term success. And most people cover their heads, go into a fight or flight mode and solve problems. And one of the lines I wrote down, almost the very first words out of Ari's mouth, he said, we're getting together, we're clarifying values, we're moving forward. And I think that's kind of a perfect description of what we should be doing. Maybe just one quick story. I did a podcast two weeks ago and uh, the guy is a consultant to education people. 
And he said, look, before we start, I got to read you something. And he had a document from a hospital administrator in New York City. And it was a statement he had just sent to his employees. And it was about Dante's Inferno and about what we're doing here and uh, our place in history and so forth. Yeah. He said, isn't that amazing? I said, yeah. And we went through the podcast. And at the end, he said, I'm really excited about these ideas. I'd like to get these to my people. But they're all in crisis. They're solving problems. So now's not the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, wait a minute. Why did you read that document to me? I said, oh, because it was so impressive. I said, now, what was that guy doing? That guy's a hospital president in New York City. That means he's getting pulverized all day long with problems. He should go home and go to bed. But what does he do? Right. He goes home and he writes a vision to inspire. Bob, lost Bob's. Oh, he's on mute. He just needs to unmute. Okay. So okay. they're coming together with a vision and they're able to keep communicating and learn their way forward in the middle of crisis all of your people are solving problems and think they're too busy because that's a management mentality i think the single most important thing i taking away from what i heard this morning is you stay calm you do all the management work and you do leadership work and you make it possible for those people to start learning your way forward because there are no answers. So that's just a quick reaction. All right, Bob. Well, thank you very much. Bob, uh, Bob's reminding me uh, one one small thing, and you know, or two things, I guess I'll add to what he's saying because I think it fits. Uh, partners group. So we have whatever eighteen. I don't know, Katie, managing partners plus three staff partners. We typically have been meeting twice a month for any number of years. We've been meeting twice a week uh, since this started and we just went back this week or last week to once a week. So those meetings have been happening with greater regularity in order to increase the speed at which we can work, but the same format exists, the same agenda exists, the same structure. So you're retaining some level of normalcy and sticking with what works, but you're allowing yourself more flexibility. Uh, and then not like it's the greatest thing in the world, but I actually right off the bat, I was like, I'm going to write a note to the staff every night uh, to Bob's point. He's reminding me about that. And I, I kept that up uh, since the middle of March. So every night it's not magic, but it's just letting people know, you know, that this is what's going on and connecting them with the rest of the organization in a way that they can't uh, be able to, uh, you know, to do physically right now. Can I remind Ari about uh, something he told me about 2008. The recession hit and he and Paul sat down and um, they had to make some decisions. And the first one was Zingerman's puts out a lot of money they give to the community food services. And they said, well, in this recession, the logical thing is to cut back on that, but everybody's going to do that. They're going to be in trouble. So let's increase our contributions and let's, instead of cutting the training budget, which everybody does, uh, they're gonna be more, people are gonna be even more needful of, of great service during this recession for a variety of reasons. Let's increase our training budget. Now those are two insane decisions. <laughs> Why don't you talk about what happened? Well, what happened is we're still here. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, I think to your point, you know, a lot of people on this call are in the same boat. They've made their living. They've made their way in the world. They've made their mark on the on the community by doing what everybody else isn't doing, uh, and and so frequently going in the opposite direction of what the trend is. I I think is really where the future is. So, uh, in the art of business pamphlet I wrote, uh, there's a quote from Robert Henry. Uh, who was an amazing art teacher early in the 20th century, and I'm realizing lived through the Spanish flu as I'm talking because he lived in New York in, uh, in the early part of the 20th century. But anyway, he, he said, people say, I don't run with crowd. I don't, my crowd doesn't run that way. And he said, but I say, why run with crowds? <laughs> so I, I have historically found if you look at what everybody else is doing and do the opposite, there might be something there, not always. Uh, so you know, one of my good friends in uh, in Dublin, they do no social media from their restaurant. She refuses to do it. They have a fabulous place. 
they're 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 going to make it through this probably just like we are it's they're they're hurting but they're going to figure it out and you know it's just trying to find creative ways that are true to who you are true to what your values are true to what your vision is and bob's point you know not just doing what everybody else is doing not overreacting in the moment and try to find a way that's actually holistically sound grounded and, and values oriented Ari, do you remember uh September, uh, afternoon of September 11th, uh, 2001. No, what, what happened that day? Well, do you remember where you, where no, you, and I, I, were in the yeah, afternoon? Of course. I was teaching a Zing train seminar. And then, it was a beautiful day. I, think I remember when Kennedy got shot, I was in second grade <laughs> and the, 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 what we called the janitor then came in to tell the teacher and she started crying Wow. and it still makes me tear up now. Yeah, when I sure. was whatever, seven years old. Have you heard the new Bob Dylan song about yeah. Kennedy? It's an incredible song. I would yeah. all of you encourage you to read, to listen to the new Bob Dylan song about that. But are you and I, I think the next day we're in a men's group together and we were sitting in uh, my office. I believe it was uh, maybe old Harris Hall yeah. on, uh, on State Street. And yeah. uh, we were talking about what's gonna happen. And we were talking about how, how is business gonna change and we had all these great ideas about autonomous vehicles and rail, the need for rail and, you know, get out of the, uh, the, the business uh, the, the, as we knew it. And 30 years later, uh, <laughs> or 20 years later, I don't think the auto companies still have caught on to this. So uh, it does take a lot to move big organizations. And some of the ideas were out there. Uh, we've all been through a lot of grief uh, in our lives. We've actually been quite fortunate uh, that we've never been invaded before. And I'll say before, because this uh, virus has invaded our country. And, yep. uh, you know, it's, it's kind of an unprecedented experience to feel like we don't have control over somebody who's attacking us. It's not, it's, it's microns measured viruses. What the hell is that? But it, it certainly has affected our lives in ways that we, uh, we are humbled by. Uh, I know there's a lot of other people out there that need support. Um, and uh, anybody, um, let me, I'm going to call on uh, Doug uh, Armstrong. Doug, are you there? Can you unmute? Doug, what is that behind you? That's our tree house uh, out at camp. Can you tell a little bit about what, Doug runs a camp called North Star Reach, which all of you should know about, all of you should visit. It's a camp for severely ill children who cannot go to camp normally and he has provided started from 12 years ago when he had a, a vision of, of this camp I, I think that according to that treehouse your vision is a little crooked Doug but uh, can you explain what that is and, and what's happening you've had to cancel the season quite sadly but how can we support you well uh, while we canceled our in-person camp experiences we quickly moved to a, a virtual model and we are definitely engaging um, kids with health challenges and their families uh, remotely. And where we ran two very successful family camp weekend sessions uh, this spring and in, in April. And we're- What does that look like? I can't imagine that. Uh, well, we, we sort of followed the schedule that we do at camp. So we had an opening campfire where families got to introduce themselves um, on Friday night. We'd mailed them a box of materials, t-shirts and supplies and activities uh, Saturday morning, we had a virtual hike at camp. Uh, we, we had videotaped a, a walk around camp and we all sat together and watched that virtual walk because normally we have a hike when we're at, at camp on, on a weekend session. We um, got together and had uh, opportunities to uh, share what this pandemic and, and what people's concerns were. So families, parents got to talk parent to parent and, and really got the, the support that they would normally get when we are in person together. Afternoon, they did activities on their own based on some assignments we gave them. They, they photographed and videoed those. We got back together and, and, and had a chance to share those. We had a campfire in the evening where kids got to perform just like they would on our stage, only they were in their living rooms. And Sunday morning, we had a closing uh, with a slideshow uh, with slides that every, or photos that everybody had sent in. And it really just felt like camp and at the end of the weekend we really felt we had built a community just like we do in person and we're working on similar models for our summer camp program which will be kids focused um, not as much family just like our, our summer in-person program.
programs would be. And we'll be mailing things out and we've got sort of set intervals and we'll be using a combination of content that is sort of one way pushed out, uh, interactive chats, uh, activities. Uh, we're, we're really excited. It, 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 I, I heard someone else say, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of forced us to, to reprioritize. We had always wanted to come up with some virtual and remote opportunities to connect these kids because we do such a great job on site when they're there for the summer uh, for a week, but then they have to wait 51 weeks until that session comes around again. And so we wanted to create some opportunity to continue to and strengthen and deepen that community uh, in between. And we just had to really flip and, and put that first. Doug, that is an incredible story. That I, if you're bringing tears to my eyes, that is a, a extremely powerful story. And I had not heard that. I know I talked to you a couple, well, probably a month ago when you had to make this terrible decision to, to not go ahead. You, you made that decision quite early. Uh, and you've put, you're only a few years old. And so, uh, you know, that's, that was heartbreaking. But I would love it if you could write that up a little bit. I'd be happy to include that in my, my Dr. Rob blog. And uh, talk about that experience and maybe even interview a couple of the families because that's that's very powerful and it's an example I think of of the ingenuity uh, and how creativity is pushed by uh, crisis Bob said it well in terms of crisis opportunity is crisis so that is very very powerful uh, we, we, uh, had a, we had a quick chat in our, our breakout room um, uh, around the fact that these families, unfortunately, are very used to being isolated at home, missing social events, missing other key milestones in their lives due to their health. And uh, the opportunity to come to camp, feel normal, be reconnected is something really rare. And unfortunately, all of us are now experiencing both of those things. We're at home, isolated, missing key milestones, and we're looking forward to that opportunity to reconnect and get back into normal. So really, we're experiencing what these families go through pretty much uh, every day. Uh, Jane Dutton, would you care to uh, comment? I'm, uh, thank you so much, Doug. And, and I, I really would like to follow up with you on that and, and see if we could uh, do that. And also, D Doug, would you, uh, before I move on to Jane, I'd like you to put on this uh, how people could reach you and, and support you because you're a nonprofit and I'm sure uh, you're trying to raise funds like everybody else right now. People don't want to depart, part, they don't want to part with their money and they don't want to depart either. Uh, but uh, I think if you could write that down, that would be great and share with us uh, how we could support uh, Camp North Star Reach. Uh, Jane, are you there? Yeah, no, I'm here. I'm, I'm also so inspired by that story, Doug. And I, I, um, I have multiple hats I'm wearing as I'm listening to that. But one of my hats is uh, as a former semi-retired faculty member at Ross and thinking, oh my gosh, we have so many students who have not necessarily lost their jobs, but now are gonna be unemployed for a year, or six months. And just thinking it would be so great to get, to employ some of these um, students or deploy them to document with video and other some of this positive organizing that's happening mm -hmm. all over the community that would be sources of wisdom but also sources of inspiration for all of us so I, I just I loved I loved hearing that and so um, thank you but it's inspired me to think about I have some research funds that need to be spent. <laughs> and I might want to hire some students to document some of what I'm hearing about. Because it's, well, Jane, it's, I added, it's, add to that, I have some students that graduated this year. I, I teach a class for uh, seniors and they're incredibly talented students who are sitting at home, so. I, I know, I know that there's, so there's this a wonderful resource group um, all over that, that um, I think would love the experience, even if we don't have a lot to pay them. Yeah, I'm paying, I'm paying a few for internships this summer as much as I can, but they're what what talent for fifteen. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of my reactions. The other reaction, I, you know, um, you know, I've studied compassion for a long time in organizations, and boy, there could not be a better time to to watch, to learn, to notice. And um, speaking of nine eleven, I mean, Rob and I got on a plane uh, in October. Uh, and went to New York right after 9-11 to document um, sort of the positive organizing and studied. Um, we went to Reuters where Rob's son was working, where Rob had volunteered to do 
um, kind of coaching for leadership under under crisis. And uh, just one quick story, uh, Phil Lynch, who was at the time the CEO or president, new president, two weeks in as new president of Reuters America, and they lost two people in 9-11 in the World Trade Center. And the story is we, Rob and I went around and, and interviewed people at all levels of Reuters and trying to understand kind of how positive organizing that was happening in the face of this moment. The story that got told over and over again by people at different levels was of Phil Lynch um, sitting with the mother of one of the guys had, who had died in, in the World Trade Center um, every day, her, the mother would come to Reuters headquarters, not believing that her son had passed. He was a Russian immigrant. It was the only, her only son. And everyone talked about Phil being there for this mother, you know, again, in the midst of so much pressure on so many fronts as a leader, and that that, to them, conveyed the heart of the organization and, you know, sustained them. And so I just use that example as a reminder of how all of you in your leadership positions uh, um, you know, are setting the ground, tilling the ground for how people are renewing people's sense of the heart of the organization by how people are responding to pain, the pain, the variable pain that's happening all over the organization. And so I'm hopeful as a person who cares a lot about the relational competence of an organization that actually this kind of a crisis not only reveals the relational soul of an organization but actually builds the muscle and the commitment that it takes you know to um to to really value the social fabric you know, of an organization um as absolutely essential for um you know, not just effective performance, but the well-being of the community that's in an organization. So, um, you know, as Jane, I, I think you're the, the second speaker in a row. I didn't in, anticipate this. It made has made me cry because <laughs> I I remember those moments with Phil Lynch and I. And the I know. Paper, the paper we wrote is called the Heart of Reuters, which was really pretty interesting. But Phil also sat with uh, one of the other people was a, an Englishman. Uh, and Phil sat with that family as well as they flew over from England to try I to remember. Find and one of the other people that uh, we, we talked about talk, had, uh, they went through his desk and they found, uh, you know, after he had died, uh, quotes uh, in, in a book uh, underlined by Bob Quinn uh, mm -hmm. called Deep Change. So, uh, you know, the, the connections were very, very powerful. So. Uh, Thank you for sharing that and help me remember that, Jane. And Phil is now a CEO of a company in Switzerland. So uh, I talk to him frequently. I'll say hi to you. Yeah. Hi to him from you. So um, I'm going to, uh, gee, I don't know where to go next. There's so many interesting questions. Let's go back to Ari and Katie and see if you guys want to try to answer some of the questions that have come up. Um, and uh, also, Katie, you're saying there's some virtual offerings and uh, some discounts that you're offering. Could you talk about that? Sure. We've got um, two and a half hour workshops that we've got. We're in the process of getting a few up for June, but we've got um, Are to Give a Great Service next week, and we also have uh, Servant Leadership on next Thursday, um, and then a few one hour sessions that are a little bit uh, more presentation style. Uh, it's a restaurant workshop series that we're doing. Uh, you don't have to work in a restaurant, though, to, to attend, and Ari's doing one on Hope on Tuesday. Uh, we've got one on uh, the introduction to visioning, I think also on Tuesday. Are these, are these all paid? You have to pay for these or are they? Yeah. Yes, they are. Um, we pay you. We pay you. Okay. No, just kidding. They are, uh, the one hour are $25 a person and then the two and a half hour, $150 a person. We also have our symposium uh, that we were going to host in June. That's going to be a live. It's all on Courageous Conversations. Not only are Ari and Paul going to speak, but we also have uh, Claude Steele um, out of California who wrote Whistling Vivaldi come in and talk. Um, Sarah Brabs, who works a lot on interpersonal conflict, uh, she's going to speak as well. So that's end of June, 195. Um, and we've got a few things that we're lining up for June that will be no charge. Ari's going to do um, a webinar for us, and we'll have one of our trainers do a webinar. But also for those, if, I think a lot of people on this call probably have some of Ari's uh, writing. Um, if not, we've got a, if you want to do gifts for graduation, um, we've got a 25% off 
or 20% off code right now, uh, Community 2020, that is off all books and pamphlets. Not pastrami? Uh, not pastrami. I know there was, <laughs> there was one call for big discounts, but uh, remember those margins we were talking about? <laughs> I, you, I, I think there's a, the time is right to uh, create a class uh, or, or a seminar on resilience because you guys have really shown resilience during multiple crises and uh, you know you keep coming out strong and God bless I hope hope it continues that direction um, any any other comments questions maybe we can have some people ask questions directly raise your hand if you have a question as one uh, one thing came to mind when Bob was speaking um, one thing that I forgot to share it's like we get ingrained to do these things and we, we forget some of those key key milestones after we had laid our staff off or furloughed, it was incredibly emotional. We felt it was awful. It was awful. Um, when we brought everybody back, or at least our core seven uh, team members back, we wrote an eight-week vision. So at the end of the use of our PPP funding, um, what, what would its success look like? And so I'm happy to share that, Rob, if you want to um, send it out to the group, because it was a really powerful exercise because we needed to come back together after some hurt um, and still a lot of uncertainty. We still we still don't know. I mean, we're hopeful and optimistic, um, but that was a good uh, unifying exercise that we all worked on. All right. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would love that. And, and this uh, uh, video of this, this talk will be sent out on Monday along with some of the key points uh, that uh, Emily Freund, who is my assistant, has been pulling out the key points from the talk and writing up a little summary of that. And I'd like to uh, include something from Dave uh, from uh, Doug Armstrong about the camp, uh, if I don't do it on Monday, at least sometime next week about what's going on there, but there's some incredible things. Doug, you didn't tell the story of the pit, the photo behind you. Could you just, can we wrap up? Cause that's a, I think that's a really good story to end with an upbeat note and maybe also where we could see the video about that, that, that tree house. Yeah, this, uh, <clears throat> the, the tree house was built um, by the tree house guys. One of which is Beefer uh, Roth who grew up in Ann Arbor and now lives in Vermont. But uh, for a couple seasons, they did a TV show on DIY Network detailing treehouse builds. And we were able to uh, schedule this at a time when, when that show was filming. And so they did a one hour segment on how they built this treehouse. And they came and they embedded in camp our first summer, lived there uh, working every day while we had our first campers coming to camp. And so they got to eat with them and, and uh, socialize with them as they were building the treehouse and, and it really was a special experience for all of us and they did it and, and really you can kind of tell it's uh, not square and, and things are, are not in line. It really looks like the kids built it and it's built out of skis and license plates and things like that, that the community donated but kind of similar to what kids might have found in grandpa's barn or dad's garage and put this tree house together. So it's, uh, it's a really, really fun and special place. And we've got this uh, one hour episode um, that documents it. Yeah, I, I've, I've been out in the tree house and it's, it's fun. And, and Doug, and I'm glad that you find, have a place to go when your wife gets upset with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a really nice, but Doug's story is an incredible. And Doug's a, Doug was a nurse at the, uh, the University of Michigan for many years in the transplant unit, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, then had this vision because of the, some of the kids that he was working with of building this camp. So it's an incredible story. We're going to wrap up. Uh, I, I don't know about the rest of you for uh, uh, 75 minutes of Zoom is about it. all my eyes will take. I, I, and I'm going to be thinking of all of you as little squares in my life for the next uh, few weeks. Uh, I, I, I love to be able to give each of you a big hug. I don't know when the hugs are going to come, but uh, at least I'll give you a big wave, everybody, and I wish we had more time to, to chat. Katie and Ari, thank you so much for, uh, for your, your comments. Uh, if there's anything else that you guys want to add that you think you didn't, we'll, we could put it in the, uh, the blog on, on Monday. Uh, we'll be back next week. I think uh, I've got Rich Sheridan, uh, and uh, let's see, uh, I talked to Kathy McDonald about maybe talking, uh, Ed Davidson from uh, Bivouac is going to talk, uh, and I'd like to get some people from around the rest of the state. Paul Jones, maybe you can suggest somebody from Western Michigan. I know you're out in Grand Rapids and uh, hear what's happening around the state, but I think it's really important for us to stay connected as business leaders, as, as educators, 
and uh, keep learning from this because we're gonna look back and this is probably the most profound experience of our life. Uh, and it's, it's, it's inspiring. Yesterday, my mother-in-law returned to her senior residence after she's 98 and she couldn't wait to get back to her own apartment. She liked living with us, but she wanted independence. And they had a Memorial Day parade uh, around the building at cars. And so my wife, Pat, was out there waving a, an American flag from the top of our Subaru. And uh, it, was, it was pretty inspiring. And so she's excited. And, and while she was here, she taught me Mahjong. So Jerry, I don't know if you play, but we, can, uh, we, I, we need a fourth. <laughs> so um, we'll see you all. Uh, be well, take care of yourself, still take good care because we're not out of this by any means and we need to be really cautious about uh, being healthy. So we'll see you all walking and biking and uh, back next Friday. Bye-bye.